Let's be real. Most of us learned any facts about the ancient Greek society known as Sparta from the 2006 film 300. But Spartans didn't just oil their pecs and kick dudes into pits. At least that's not all they did. While the movie, and our much more boring history books, highlight some of the more impressive aspects of Spartan society, there are plenty of weird facts about Sparta that seem too extreme to be real. So, today we're diving into some of the weird but true facts about Sparta. But first, be sure to subscribe to the Weird History channel. After that, leave a comment and let us know what other ancient civilizations you want to hear the dirt about. Okay, grab a sword and get cozy. Spartans were tough as nails, and their steel hearts and steelier skin began forming when they were babies. Immediately after birth, Spartan infants were bathed not in soap and water, but wine, because wine is cooler than water. But this wasn't done to give the babies a newborn buzz. The wine bath was a kind of macabre strength test. Spartans believed that overly weak babies would convulse and die in the wine bath leaving only those who deserved their lives. Geez, even birds who tossed their young out of the nest were like, calm down. Babies didn't have it easy after their wine soak either. Spartan mothers carried their be tough mantras into the nurseries and often left babies to cry alone for hours on end. This must have impressed other societies of the time, however, as Spartan women were often sought after to be nannies. Hmm, that would be an interesting version of Mrs. Doubtfire. Spartan babies were also brought before the Council of Elders who inspected their bodies for any deformities. If, for any reason, a baby didn't live up to the elders' high standards, they were left to perish on a mountainside. Luckily, this practice went well out of fashion by the dawn of the family road trip. If you kids do not knock it off, I will turn this car around and leave you on a Spartan cliff. In ancient Sparta, gender parity and female independence were entrenched in society. Physical fitness was considered an important value for both men and women, and women were encouraged to exercise publicly alongside their male counterparts. All completely buck naked, nude. But in Spartan culture, the nude form wasn't taught to induce lust, but instead to give women a care for good health. As a result, women would often compete in sports, including foot races and wrestling. You show up to your gym nude these days, all you hear is, Yeah, you gotta put on your clothes, or leave, please. Have we gone backwards as a society? Sparta's emphasis on female strength helped them in practical matters, too. Famously, Sparta did not build walls to protect the city. As lawgiver and apparent action one-liner giver, like Kyrgyz said, a city is better protected with brave men and not by bricks. But what happens when most of those brave men are off fighting a war? Sparta was a long way past its prime by 272 BCE, no longer the dominant land power in Greece. With their army campaigning in Crete, the city looked ripe for plunder. Pyrrhus, the king of the ancient Greek kingdom Epirus, was still smarting from a costly expedition in Italy. So he decided to take advantage of the Sparta situation and led his army to the seemingly undefended city. Yet this decision would turn out to be a very bad idea. It's the kind of wisdom you'd expect from a guy who lent his name to the phrase Pyrrhic victory, meaning a battle won at so great a cost you would have been better off staying at home. With an attack on Sparta imminent, the Spartan women stayed to help defend the city, digging trenches, administering to the injured, and supporting with food, drink, and equipment the heavily outnumbered men left to defend the city. Over two days, the small Spartan force and a handful of allies from neighboring states held off the forces of Pyrrhus and forced him to turn back. Pyrrhus met his end soon afterward. Forget hiring the perfect glam squad to give the bride the perfect updo. Spartan women actually cut their hair short or shaved off their locks completely before their wedding ceremonies. Why? Were they just big fans of Mad Max Fury Road? Well, some historians think it was to signal the transition from virgin to woman. Virgins wore their hair long. But upon becoming a wife, a woman was not allowed to wear her hair long again. And there were presumably no compromises made for beehive hairdos or mohawks. 
But for Spartan brides, the head shaving was just the beginning of the tradition. Next, they put on men's clothes and sandals. Then they waited for the grooms to come steal them away in the night, but in a fun romantic way, not in a ransom type way. And then the happy couple couldn't live together for years to come. The military was so important to Sparta that the society's men were forced to live in a military barracks until they were 30 years old. While Spartan culture did prefer men to marry at this age, many married several years earlier. And for these unlucky couples, they weren't able to sleep under one roof together for years. Long distance relationships are a killer. Despite this type of delay, marriage was undeniably important to Spartan culture. So much so that Spartan bachelors were often looked down upon and ridiculed for not adding to Sparta's ranks. Bachelor party was not a common rental. There are only three constants in life. Death, taxes, and some of that tax money being spent on tombstones after death. But in Sparta, the tombstone was only meted out to those who truly deserved one. Namely, the soldier who was slain on the battlefield. In fact, that soldier would be buried with the gravestone on the very battlefield they died. With only their name and the phrase, in war, engraved. That is not only extremely metal, but an open invitation for a serious haunting. There was only one other class of deceased who deserved a marker in the ground women who died in childbirth. Because they bore the future warriors of Sparta, these women were respected enough to acquire a headstone in death, though it's unknown what was inscribed on them. As for all the other dead Spartans, presumably left on a cliff somewhere. Spartan citizens were, let's say, not sympathetic to those they conquered. When they would devastate and destroy a fellow Greek stronghold, especially those from Laconia and Messenia, they would enslave their prisoners and give them the term helots, which linguists assert comes from the root word for to be made prisoner. And life for them was pretty much helot on earth. Since a Spartan's focus was always on being a soldier, the helots did most of the unskilled labor in Sparta, including being farmers, domestic servants, and nurses. And before you ask how much they got paid, they didn't. They were straight up enslaved. The Spartans could be cruel in their treatment to their enslaved workers. Some would even force a helot to become extremely intoxicated so they would act foolish in public. Then the Spartan men would ridicule the drunken helots and use them as examples for their sons on how not to behave. Most viciously, each year the Spartans declared a sort of mass war on the helots in a tradition that felt like the Hunger Games crossed with the Purge, with just an extra dash of wanton destruction for good measure. Young Spartan men who had just completed their military training were encouraged to track down and slay as many slaves as they could, especially the strongest and fittest. Ironically, since the helots constituted such a large portion of the Spartan population, with seven helots to every one Spartan, there was always a fear of an uprising. Thus, this yearly celebration of terrorism showed the helots the dominance of the Spartan force and quelled any thoughts for uprisings, creating a cycle of oppression and violence. Some typical milestones for a seven-year-old in the modern age include developing a sense of time, being able to solve simple math problems, and becoming empathetic. Now, here are some typical milestones for a Spartan seven-year-old. One, wielding a sword. Two, becoming an indestructible avatar of death. Yeah, there's a subtle difference there. At age seven, Spartan boys were taken away from their parents and began training for the military. During this training process, these boys would compete in refereed fights with other boys. They were told to steal food, as a cunning soldier should be able to do. And if they were caught stealing the food they were told to steal, they got flogged. In fact, flogging was a sort of go-to punishment for the Spartans. And if the boys cried while being flogged, they were flogged again until they could bear the pain in silence. But what happens if the floggers screw up flogging? Who flogs the flogmen? At age 12, the Spartan boys were sent out to the wilderness with nothing but a cloak and then were expected to fend for themselves. If they survived this experience, the boys joined the Spartan army at age 20, where they remained reserve soldiers until reaching the age of 60. And if they thought about early retirement, you guessed it, more flogging. The Spartan political structure was unique from most other Greek societies at the time, in that they had a dual kingship, or two kings, that ruled together at the same time. They presumably also shared an apartment and had a catchy theme song. The kings did not have unlimited power, 
but were balanced by an elected board of senior magistrates, which they called ephors, and a council of elders who were all over 60. There was also a general assembly of citizens, which Sparta defined as men over 30, who elected these officials to their positions. When you think about it, the concept of money as we know it, little slips of paper we trade with each other for doing things like making food or placing cucumbers over our eyes, is arbitrary. Money can be really any object. And yet, the Spartan currency, which is literally big iron rods, does feel a little bit silly. How do you put that in your wallet? But as Greek philosopher Plutarch pointed out, the inconvenience was the point. For who would steal or receive as a bribe or rob or plunder that which could neither be concealed nor possessed with satisfaction, nay, nor even cut to pieces with any profit? Plutarch probably crushed high school debate. In addition to being harder to steal, iron currency in ancient times made sense for several reasons. First, metal is difficult to damage and doesn't break down easily, unlike paper money, which has to be folded just right in order to fit into a vending machine. Second, metal tools can pretty much be used anywhere, so it doesn't matter if you're exchanging money with your Spartan neighbor or the traveler visiting from Athens. Everyone can find a use for a big metal rod. No vending machine would dare deny you. So what do you think? Was Sparta just like you pictured, or not at all what you expected? Let us know in the comments below, and while you're at it, check out some of these other videos from our Weird History.